I'm David Spears. Welcome to Insiders. Melbourne's Outer East was the epicentre of a political earthquake last night. For the first time in more than 100 years, an opposition lost a seat to an incumbent government at a federal by-election. Voters in Aston punished the Liberal Party. The swing to Labor a whopping 7% on the latest count. Liberals were stunned and are struggling to explain it. For his explanation of what went wrong and what it means for his leadership, I was joined live in the studio by the opposition leader, Peter Dutton. Peter Dutton, welcome to the program. Morning, David. Now, you said during this campaign that the by-election result would be, and I quote, a verdict on the leaders. No question about that. So, Mr Dutton, what is the verdict on your leadership? Well, I think there were many messages uh, out of last night. Um, obviously, the difficulties for us in Victoria haven't been just, you know, germinated in Aston over the course of the last five weeks. Even back to 2013, with all of my predecessors, Victoria is the one state that we've never held a majority of seats in. And there are huge issues for us at a state level as well. For almost a quarter of a century, mm. uh, it's been a Labor government here in Victoria, bar a couple. So uh, many lessons, including for me and for our party, and uh, we'll take those. We'll listen to I don't want to come what to the that. people who Aston have said and we'll, we'll act on it. But you indicated this was more than just the Victorian problem for the Liberal Party. You, you said in your own words this was a test of your leadership. So have you failed that test? Well, we, we didn't win the seat. So uh, by definition, uh, we have a lot of work to do. I accept responsibility and... I'm the leader of the party. I was there last night uh, to do that. I agreed to come on to the show this morning uh, knowing that uh, if you win, lose or draw, you need to front up. And, and we appreciate that. Exactly. No, no, and I'm happy to do that. Have, have, you passed, have you failed your own test? Well, again, by not winning the election, uh, we, we've failed that test that have been set uh, by us, uh, for us by the Victorian people. That's, that's the reality. Now, the, the question is how we rebuild from here the policies that we have, the brand rebuilding that we need to do mm. in Victoria, and, and that I'll, is I'll a very significant issue for when us. When Malcolm Turnbull uh, said the Longman by-election was a test of his leadership and, and the Liberals went backwards, you challenged him for the leadership. Last night was far worse for the Liberal Party in the Aston by-election. Why should you stay as leader? Well, I didn't challenge him for the leadership. Malcolm resigned as the leader, but uh, that, that's you know ancient history. Uh, I mean, interestingly, you, you bring Malcolm up. I mean, Malcolm, who was small L Liberal, uh, good leader of our party, uh, didn't do any good in, in Victoria. Uh, mm. Tony Abbott before him. In fact, we've gone backwards since John Howard's high water mark in '96. So, do we have a lot uh, to rebuild in Victoria? Of course we do, David. And I accept responsibility uh, for us not winning the mm. by election. We but had a should great... you stay as leader? Uh, of course I should. And uh, I can tell you, it makes me more determined to rebuild this party and to be in a winning position by 2025. I've been in a marginal seat for the last 22 years. Uh, I've won it by 217 votes. I've won it by 9% at different elections and high and wa low water marks. That's, that's the nature of politics. Ours is now an opportunity to rebuild. We will do that over the course of the next couple of years and we will go into the next election in a position uh, that will see us win it. But in terms of your achievements as leader, you said last night that I have had one test for my leadership, whether we can keep the party together. Um, is that really your main goal, keeping the show together? Shouldn't your main goal be trying to reconnect with voters that you're losing? Well, well uh, of course it is, David. But the fact is that after a government goes into opposition, as was the case with the Rudd-Gillard government, uh, as was the case with the Howard government uh, in 2007, uh, parties always tear themselves apart in opposition. It's exactly what Mr Albanese was a part of when Julia Gillard and Kevin Rudd lost the election. So uh, we haven't gone through that period uh, of self-destruction. Is we've that because helped... you have to appease the Nats and Conservatives in your ranks? Not at all. It's because we've been able to uh, hold the show together uh, because I have respect for my colleagues. Uh, I have a leadership style which I believe that they appreciate, which is why people are uh, very strongly expressing their support uh, to me and no doubt uh, to you in, in relation to the mood in the party room at the moment. But w we have a particular problem in Victoria. There's no question about that. And well, we have to learn those that. lessons and rebuild. So, I mean, last night was historic for a couple of reasons. It's more than 100 years, has been pointed out, uh, since an opposition lost a seat to a government at a federal by-election. But also look at this. You now hold only those two blue seats in all of metropolitan Melbourne. Can you explain why? Well, David, as I said, if you go back to 2013 when we had a landslide victory, Victoria was still held by the Labor Party in terms of the majority number of seats. Uh, it's been going backwards for us since 1996 uh, before I got into the parliament. Uh, no Liberal leader before me uh, has been able to rectify the situation 
in Victoria at a state level, um, and full credit to Greg Mirabella and the uh, the team. But but, the, but you the keep Victoria, going backwards. So I'm just asking why. Well, look, well, this is what we need to assess, and we need to understand. You why don't know. We're, well, we're ten we're ten months into this period of opposition, so the claims that we should have policies out there uh, and announced. I mean, you're you're a professional uh, in this business. No opposition's releasing every policy for. Uh, the next election. I'm not suggesting that. I'm just month asking whether so you have an understanding as to why you've gone backwards well, so far. Well, our, our, our brand, our brand uh, has suffered terribly why? in Victoria. Why? Well, uh, people haven't voted for us at a state level. Uh, in the last 24 years, 21 of those years, they voted for Labor. So instead why, of us. why is that? You well, must that, have some idea. Well, that, that's what we need to what we need to assess. You don't know. Uh, I, I, I think we need to uh, do the analysis of Aston have an understanding of uh, what people were motivated by, uh, what caused them to vote Labor uh, for the first time. I mean, for both this is major a problem, parties... Though, if, you don't, if you're unable to put your finger on why the Liberals are in such trouble in Victoria... Well, David, uh, I, I mean, Labor spent the last five weeks throwing mud at us, at uh, Roshina Campbell, at me, uh, at the Liberal, at the Liberal brand. Well, I mean, they, they are effective campaigners. And Daniel Andrews uh, is, is ruthless uh, at a state level. He demonstrated that at the most recent election. So I think there are issues in relation to policy, to personnel, uh, issues uh, in relation to our campaigning techniques. All, all of those obviously so, are the lessons So the we why need to is learn. that Labor's better at campaigning? I mean, your, your Liberal MPs will be troubled by what's happened last night, understandably. They'd, they'd be looking to see a leader say, I know what's going on. Well, David, I think there are obvious issues that, uh, that we need to address within the division here. In Victoria, uh, that's a statement of the obvious, and that has been going on for a long time. Uh, I, I intend to do everything that I can from a federal level to be able to uh, to rectify that. Well, let, when okay, you well let's at... talk about that. One of the big issues uh, over recent weeks in Victoria and elsewhere has been this issue of transgender rights. Mm. Peter Dutton, where do you stand on this? Well, I don't discriminate against anyone, David, and I won't tolerate people discriminating against people on the basis of their religion, of their sex, uh, their gender. Uh, their skin colour, anything. Should and Liberal think, MPs go to an anti-trans rally? And I, well, let, 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 let me finish. And, and I think I've demonstrated that over uh, my period of time in public life. Uh, I think people should have uh, respect, and I think also um, the debate runs two ways. There, there are mm. very strong views uh, within many parts of Australian society, maybe not right here in the inner city, you know, um, areas of, uh, of our country, but in the outer mm. metropolitan areas. This is an issue in terms of, of women's rights and the gender issue uh, that, that has parents and others very worked up. So would you have a be... problem with one of your MPs going to an anti-trans rally? I, I, I don't believe that uh, our MPs should be going to, uh, to anti-anything rallies, to be honest, uh, apart from anti-Labor Party uh, rallies, because uh, they're ultimately what does wrong by our country. If you look at the debt uh, that the government's in at the moment, if you look at the spending policies, you look at the inflation, that's feeding into higher interest rates. Okay. Uh, by the end of this but don't, term, don't go to these anti trans By the end of this your, term, your point I, there? by the end of this term, I think the uh, the prime minister is going to, you know, all of the, uh, you know, the joy that he's expressing at the moment. Um, I think it's going to be a very different. Well, dynamic we'll see. By More the broadly, election. beyond that issue, can I ask you what does the Peter Dutton led Liberal Party stand for? Well, we stand for uh, aspiration. Uh, we stand for entrepreneurialism. So small businesses, uh, we stand for national security obviously um, and we always stand for cleaning up a Labor mess when we get back into government so that people so uh, can much make the their own things, choices. Much the same things as, as the Scott Morrison led Liberal Party and, and well, others. Well it goes, it goes back to the traditions of Menzies and uh, I grew up in the Liberal Party under John Howard, I was Assistant Treasurer to Peter Costello. Uh, we, we make decisions that allow people uh, for example to keep more of their own money so that mm. they can support their own family uh, and th there is, you know, a lot that we can put uh, together in way by way of policy before the next election. But we're not announcing all of that mm. at the ten. But is there point. a need for philosophical renewal, given where you're at? Well, again, David, I think some of the uh, the attributes of the Liberal Party, uh, frankly, are timeless and worth us re-prosecuting. I think in recent years, uh, the Liberal Party has allowed itself to be defined by our opponents, and I think it's time for us to take that back, uh, to stand up for what we believe in, whether it's uh, trendy or not. Uh, and some of that, um, I believe, is uh, what the Australian public demand, particularly in our seats in outer metro areas and regional areas, and that's what we're going to do. It deliver. doesn't sound like this morning you're signalling any shift, any change, any new direction. 
Well, if you're asking me about the, the fundamentals of our party, uh, they're, they're not going to change. Uh, we have a proven track record when we're in government. Uh, we've just come off the back of a 10-year period uh, federally. And if you look at the two parties, the Liberal Party has been much more successful uh, in the modern era than Labor at a federal level. At a state level, it's a different story, uh, particularly in Victoria. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we need to assess. OK, but any change on... Policy. Well, of, if we've got if we've got this? new policies to take to the election, David, we'll do it in, in good in good time. We're not rushing out with policies at the ten month mark that people will have no recollection of by the, the three year mark. All so right. well, uh, another there's issue. always a timing in this business, mm. and now is not the right time to be out there um, putting out costed policies and changes to taxation policy or social policy otherwise. That, mm -hmm. That'll come in due course. Let me ask you about an issue that's also important to um, uh, voters, not not just in Melbourne, climate change. Mm. Do you accept that uh, what the scientists are saying, the world's already warmed by 1.1 degrees and is likely to breach the 1.5 degree tipping point in the next decade? Well, David, we have been uh, the worst salespeople uh, in terms of what we've done for the environment. The, the claims made by the Prime Minister today about the amount of solar, uh, the amount of... Uh, uh, hydro, uh, the battery investment in our country all happened under a Liberal government. The problem is that we never prosecuted the argument. We were never successful in getting out there telling people what we had done. So we need to have renewables in the system to address mm -hmm. climate change. We need to be able to firm them up. And this is where this debate's going to twist. But I was, I was over asking the next you about the, the extent of the problem. Do you accept what the IPCC have said? Have you looked I'm, at their I'm, I'm happy to accept it, but we, yeah. we need to be realistic about what we can do as a country. And driving businesses and industries offshore is only going to increase emissions into the global environment and it's going to lose Australian jobs and economic productivity. So the cement industry is one such industry that I think is at real risk of leaving our shores. Now, well, we're what, not going to stop why, using why you, cement. Why do you say that? Because, you know, we've heard Well, because from... we've spoken very clearly with the industry and... and they're leaving, that, that they? is the very... Are they told you, they've told you they're going to go? They have very grave concerns about the future of their sector. Uh, there are issues around steel. Uh, we have... Uh, this because the, the Chief Executive of Manufacturing Australia says the way the safeguards mechanism changes have been designed uh, means they won't have to pass on significant increases for steel, cement, aluminium, bricks. Are they telling you something different? Well, David, if, if you've got a company that has cost imposed on them, they're either going to take a cut to their bottom line, that is that they're going to reduce their profit, or they're going to pass those costs on to consumers. Now, I think there are a lot of consumers out there at the moment who are trying to build a new house or renovate their existing house who understand that the cost of that building, the materials, the labour is through the roof. It's just not what and, they're saying publicly. Well, I, I, can, I can tell you uh, what we've spoken, where we've spoken to people, uh, it causes us grave concern. They're telling you something different, are they? Uh, I, I think there are a lot of business leaders, frankly, in the country at the moment who are saying things differently in private than what they're saying Why? publicly. Why? Uh, because I think they're worried about social media. Um, you guys all, you know, you'll so race So they're lying to, to the public? I, I mean, David, you will race to Twitter after this interview after insiders to see what your supporters have to say. I can and guarantee you I won't. Really? Well, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm pleased to hear it. But there are a lot of people who do, including in the corporate sector. And uh, I think it's time for a lot of those leaders to stand up because the, the, the fears of a gas disruption this winter or next summer are real. We need to be able to firm up renewables and we don't have the ability to do that. So will you repeal these changes to the safeguards well, mechanism? We'll, we'll make our policies uh, in, uh, public in, in real time. Well, why uh, in, are you hesitant on that? Because you've already said you'd repeal a fairly modest tax increase for big superannuation accounts. Why can't you say the same about the well, safeguards David, changes? when we make a decision on our policy, we'll announce it. That's, that's the point. Uh, and we, we go through a process uh, to cost it properly, that's the that's responsible way. So this might stay that's in place. How, that's how we do... Well, we, we haven't yet made a decision about what our policies will be at the next election. Okay. So when we're closer to the campaign... Um, but they, they will be about trying to reduce, not increase prices. Mm. And they will be about trying to increase stability, not allow labour to disrupt supply. Because if you get these businesses who have capital that can be deployed here or deployed mm. to Peru or somewhere else, if they decide not to do it here, it means Australian jobs go. And if we're making the input cost too high, which Labor is doing at the moment with energy, not just households, but businesses as well who suffer and ultimately take a decision to leave Australia. A final issue, uh, another big one this week, the Indigenous Voice. Um, the opposition's been raising all sorts of questions during the week about whether the Voice would be advising the Reserve Bank or the Defence Force. Look, with an eight-year life expectancy gap, worsening rates of Indigenous incarceration and, and suicide, do you really think The Voice is going to want to spend its time telling the Reserve Bank what it should be doing? Well, Megan Davis uh, has pointed this out yesterday, that uh, all of these areas will be 
within scope, David. I think every Australian starts with the desire to help Australia, help Australians of an Indigenous heritage, particularly those kids. And if yeah, you within, at, within scope, well, let, let me with, finish this because yeah. I think it's a really important point. I mean, I think when you look at what happens in Alice Springs now, mm. when we've gone up there, and I was up there only a few months ago. The women up there are screaming out for support. They have a voice now and it's not being listened to. So do I think that the voice is the panacea or that it's going to create uh, change for those people? Well, the Prime Minister needs to explain that because instinctively anybody would support that. But that, that has not been what the Prime Minister has been able to The point to is there are these real problems for the voice to get on with. Isn't it a bit alarmist, a bit ridiculous even, to, to say, oh, it's going to be you know, um, gumming up the works of the Reserve Bank or the Defence Force? Well, David, this is the biggest change proposed to the Australian Constitution since Federation, mm. and the Prime Minister can't answer the basic questions in relation to how it will apply, how it will work, and you can't out-legislate constitutional change. So mm. if you're going to change the Constitution, you need to be assured that it's going to be for the best. It's not going to be another layer of bureaucracy, that the voice will actually reflect the views of people on the ground so that you can would get you, the sort of would, outcomes would you back you're it, talking would about. Would you back it if the words executive government were taken out? Well, the, the government's been clear that they... Uh, and In fact, they've gone against the Solicitor General's advice on this issue. That they are That's going not to keep, what they say, well, to be clear. Well, to, to our view is they've said the Solicitor General supports where, where they've landed. The, the, the Solicitor General and the Attorney General went into the committee with advice to take out executive government. They were overruled. They deny that, they Mr Dutton. They deny by... that, Mr Dutton. Well, I just need to be you know, straight with our view as they've denied that. That's what happened, David. Um, How so, do you know? Well, I, I, I have a, a better understanding, I suspect, than... Were you in the uh, room? No, but I have a very clear understanding. I think some of your panellists and others have written on this uh, with multiple sources out of the room. Uh, and it has been the advice yeah. to the government consistently. If you but open, regardless, if, you if they took up, that wording out, you still may not back it, right? Well, we'll have a look at uh, the wording, but the government's been clear that they're not going to take it out, and mm. that is a deal-breaker for them, and the Prime Minister has sided with the committee over the advice of the Solicitor General. So when, General. Will, when will you make a call on well, this? Well, in, in, in due course, and, and our party room will meet, uh, to have uh, a discussion about what is a very substantial change. You and wouldn't stop the referendum going ahead, though, would you? Well, David, we'll, we'll meet as a party room, uh, and we'll have a look at... Uh, uh, the options on the mm. table for us. We you want Australians to have a say. We supported the mechanism, mm. uh, and uh, as you point out, uh, I think in your earlier package, uh, that went through the Senate with the support of the mm. coalition. We work with the government to facilitate mm. that. Uh, we've had a genuine approach, but we've uh, we've got questions that are legitimately being asked, and if the Prime Minister can't answer them, uh, then Australians, mm. if they have a hesitation, won't support it in the absence of an understanding of what they're voting for. But you wouldn't vote against the referendum going ahead, surely? Well, David, we're happy for the people to have a say. I mean, we've okay. been very clear about that. Uh, mm. But uh, And we don't hold a majority in the lower house, uh, nor in the upper house. So uh, we'll work with the government. We've been, uh, we've demonstrated that, uh, mm. despite all the rhetoric that comes out uh, from the Prime Minister. There are many bills where we've supported the government. We'll continue to do that. But uh, where you're talking about constitutional change, you need to make sure that it is going to deliver the benefits, particularly to Indigenous Australians, that, that the government's foreshadowed. Peter Dutton, we'll have to leave it there. I do appreciate you fronting up this morning. Pleasure. Thank Thanks, David. Thank All you. Right, well, let's get to our panel. And uh, we are joined this morning by Nikki Saver, Raf Epstein and Phil Curry. Welcome to you all. Um, Nikki, let's start with you. What happened in Aston last night and what do you think it uh, means for Peter Dutton? Um, well, I, I do think that the problems for the Liberal Party go well beyond leadership. Um, I think there are major structural problems inside the Liberal Party. Uh, the base is uh, very much out of sync, I think, with uh, community sentiment. And I think you can put that down to uh, the branch stacking that has been going on for years now. Uh, the parliamentary party, as it is now, is also out of sync uh, with community sentiment. On top of that, uh, in the um, year almost uh, since the election, what we've seen uh, from the opposition is this strategy of opposing everything, everywhere, all at once. And last night, it blew up in their faces. And so if they don't heed the message, at least from that last night, and I haven't seen anything yet to indicate that that has really penetrated, Certainly, they don't seem to think that there's any urgency about tackling what is wrong with the Liberal Party. You, don't, you, don't, you haven't heard that? You didn't hear that just now from Peter Dutton at all? Uh, I heard words like, yes, we'll um, have a look at what happened 
and uh, then we'll have a review. Uh, but uh, fundamentally, no change. Um, so uh, I think, uh, no, that's not a proper appreciation <coughs> of what's happening and what is required. And yeah. if they keep listening to um, all those who say you're not right-wing enough, you're not conservative enough, well, they're on the path to oblivion. Raf, that uh, sea of red across Melbourne is pretty stark. I, I should note our map had one seat. Higgins as Teal, it's Labor, of course. They've been losing ground to Labor and uh, Teal independence in, in Sydney and, and Melbourne. And, and this continues last night. You spent time there in Aston during this campaign. What do you put this result down to? Uh, I think you put, you put it down fundamentally to the Liberal Party, especially in Victoria, are not seen as competent. Why they are not seen as competent, I would argue, is because they, spend, they have spent way too long arguing amongst themselves. Um, the biggest problem for the Liberal Party, and frankly for Peter Dutton, if they can't win votes there, if you can't win votes in Bayswater and Baronia and Roeville and Scoresby, this is... These are the suburbs. They're like the suburbs of every major city. It, there's a reason the Liberal Party is barely holding on in Perth, in Adelaide, in Sydney, in Melbourne. I think Sydney, um, there's no Liberal seats on, on the harbour. I put it down to the competence question, and the competence question comes down to the fact that the biggest, the red hot button issues in Australian politics, climate change, women in politics, an anti-corruption commission, this, conf this bizarre obsession with bathrooms, <clears throat> they, are, they, they go off. Those issues go off. They always go off. I can generate a lot of calls on them. <laughs> they are not issues that dominate actually the Labor-Liberal divide. They dominate... There's a divide inside the Liberal mm -hmm. Party and that they fight about those things. It's not whether or not you think either, any of those things are right or wrong. They're fighting about those things. Most voters hear that as... They don't hear the detail. They're just like, oh, well, you're, you're not in the race. You're not competent. You're not talking about the stuff that affects me. If I can just add one more thing to what Peter Dutton said, that no one at this stage in the cycle has come up with policies. What are the things that those 18 Labor, federal and uh, state Labor MPs would have been door knocking on in the seats of Aston? Childcare and things like renewable energy. When did Anthony Albanese announce those things? A little over a year after he became opposition yeah, leader. Yeah. He junked Bill Short. Very early on. Childcare and renewable stuff. And that's the same bread and butter this is what we're going to do for your stuff, that they were door knocking on with Aston. Yeah. So there's and a lot of problems is, there for the Liberals. Phil, this, this is the point. I mean, yes, uh, there, there are big questions about the leadership, about the candidate being you know, um, surfed into Aston and so on, but there are these bigger questions uh, as well about the Liberal brand. Well, it's definitely on the nose in Victoria, isn't it? We don't need any more confirmation of that uh, after last night. It's I'm not the... just Victoria. No, Sorry. but it's I especially... Mean, out of office... Everywhere yeah, but, on uh, the mainland. Clearly it's especially bad down here. <laughs> like, like we're worse here than anywhere, but not great really anywhere. Except Queensland. Mm. And Queensland is, the, is, is um, like this sort of stronghold now, this redoubt. And some, they, some of the... they federally, can they squeeze any more out of Queensland? They need, no, they need to win. No, but one Melbourne. of the complaints that comes from within the, the Liberal caucus is that Queensland... Uh, psyche is so dominant now. Mm. One, one, one MP, MP said to me that it's virtually we're becoming the LNP because of their influence, and this is sort of driving... Some of this conservatism. But you can't win federal government without. No, I know, I know. Well, I'm, not, I'm not saying they can't. I, you know, I, I, you know, Al, Albanese, Mr. Albanese was critical of Mr. Dutton this morning for saying in his speech last night, "I'm, I'm holding the party together." That's that, that's not an immaterial sort of thing to do. Without 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 unity, you go nowhere. You yeah. can't even begin to build if you if you're ripping each other to shreds. So I don't think that's a criticism. But the difficulty is how you go from there to sort of you know winning back votes in the centre. I mean, as you know, um, Paul Fletcher said during the week, as Scott Morrison used to say, we have compulsory voting, and compulsory voting, the benefit that it keeps our politics centred. It stops it going mad left or mad right. But they haven't... But, no, but they have, they, this is where this is, we haven't done this. this so is, we know, haven't but heard they've it. held the party together because they haven't taken a stand That's on right. anything. That's right. It's, 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 it's so can I say something about his language? So can I say something about Peter Dutton's language? And he said in the interview, this is about turning the transgender, the entire transgender community into a threat in bathrooms, by the way. But that aside, I, I do disagree with Peter Dutton. He said, this is an issue that has parents and others very worked up. There's a small group of people in the community who are very worked up about that. I'd be amazed if when the Liberal Party and the Labor Party do focus groups, that is an issue. Uh, I think that... And I actually asked Peter Dutton about this on the radio. He didn't want to step it back. 
He called the changes to superannuation socialism. Uh, Ted O'Brien, who's the shadow climate person, said that the safeguard mechanism was decapitating the economy. I'm not sure that the language is where the middle of the country is. And, and I think that mm. just that choice mm. of words is really important. So in the absence of you know, new ideas from the Liberal Party right now, they've been spending a lot of time, probably 90% of their questions in Parliament are about the cost of living, right? yeah. trying to pin the blame on Anthony Albanese. Now, you can understand that as, as, as a major focus, but this has been almost it everything. It didn't work. How, is, is it working at all? It didn't it's work. Not, both, both the research from both sides during the by-election showed that people were not blaming the government for mm. cost of living increases or for interest rate rises. Do they need they to change tack now, do you think, on that? Will they need to change tack? Oh, yeah. I, do they, I think they do to a certain extent. I mean, they keep hoping that at some point um, that will turn and maybe it will mm. after a period of time, but it's certainly not working at the moment. Can I raise a state flag on that? 2018, crime was the issue. Crime was definitely an, an issue. Who did they trust to fix it? Labor, not Liberal. Well, that's, Last year that's... in the state election, health was the issue in South Australia that got the Labor Party in. Health was the issue in the Victorian election in 22. But they didn't trust the Liberal Party to fix the health issue. It, it does come to... And Peter Darton's a lot smarter and a lot more uh, sophisticated than his detractors would suggest. But until the party agrees on those divides, you don't get treated as a serious proposition. The cost of living is the biggest issue. People came out of the supermarket and asked, and this woman looked down at the box and said, this cost me more than 50 bucks. Like, it's definitely the issue. Mm. But who do you trust to fix it? So let's talk this... about um, Peter Dutton just quickly. Mm. Uh, his leadership appears to be safe, mm. despite uh, you know, this shocker last night, Phil. Why is that? Just give us a sense of the dynamic right now in the party, well, on the leadership. Well, principle. principally, there's no alternative. There's just no conceivable alternative to Mr Dutton. You know, Susan Lee, no. Angus Taylor. No. None... no. No, 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 if you speak to people, in, and I've spent the last two weeks in Canberra with Sitting Week and bumped into a lot of Liberals and, you know, canvassed this pr proposition, would you lose? And, you know, someone said, look, it doesn't help over the long term. But, look, they are generally happy with the way he's he's leading. I mean, the, the irony of the Liberal Party is the divisions are, are, are a bomb site, but the Federal Parliamentary Party is quite united. Yeah. And they are quite happy with the latitude both that he gives to the right and the left. Um, there's, you know, no, no, no one's sort of storming the barricades, but, um, but clearly this is going to raise questions about policy direction, about philosophy, and I think pressure will, will, will build. It's, you know, to, to, it's not, it's not about swinging left or right. It's about, as, as Mr. Dutton said in the interview, it's, you know, those liberal traits, you know, the economy, industrial relations, stuff like that. But it's also a shout out to the voters at the last election who sent you a message on climate change, who sent you a message on things like to, to some form of acknowledgement, which just hasn't happened. Yeah. What, so it's, it's, it's about the balance. You don't have to go that way no, or that way. It's but about... you've got to have a leader who isn't, you know, um, people haven't already made their minds up and made their minds up against. Um, that, that, that would be the danger, I suppose, for Peter Dutton. What's your sense of how the leadership looks right now. I think he's safe for the time being. And although there is no real altern alternative, someone will always put their hand mm, up. Eventually. And um, I think um, <laughs> this is, you know, a bit of a fantasy land thing, but um, I heard the other day that Paul Fletcher was going around saying to people that he wanted to stay in Bradfield because he thought he could be leader when um, Dutton's leadership collapses and they're looking more towards the end of the year. Now, you know, never in a million years, I think, will Fletcher become leader, but they are talking about it and they are looking ahead to a few months' time and I would suspect that after the voice referendum, depending on what happens there, then we're probably into a killing season for the Liberals. All right, we, uh, we will see. But right now, uh, he does appear to be safe. Let's turn to what happened in Parliament during the week in the lead-up to this by-election. As I mentioned, the government uh, has been very busy in Parliament. The big one was getting through the safeguards mechanism changes. We now have a legislated climate policy for the first time since the, um, the Julie Gillard carbon tax was repealed 10 years ago, mm. uh, as it happens. Um, there was a deal done between Labor and the Greens on this, and depending who you listen to, you can get a sense of who thinks they came out of this uh, better. The Greens certainly think they did. This puts a limit on coal and gas expansion in this country. 
In fact, the limit must decline over time. This means a huge number of those 116 coal and gas projects in the pipeline will not be able to go ahead. But if you listen to Anthony Albanese, Labor really didn't give much away. You will note, uh, hopefully pretty obviously, that the demands that were placed on us of ruling out uh, future projects are ones that we said we wouldn't agree with and we haven't. Phil, what's happened in this deal? Well, the fact we're still talking about it um, and still trying to work that out, what it actually means, shows that something happened, but we're not quite sure. But it's, <laughs> it's, it's, but it, 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 in a net basis, it's not good for gas. In terms, yeah, they, they, they agreed to legislate the cap, uh, which is like a salary cap, if you like, except you've got 215 players on the team or your heavy emitters, and the salary cap comes down over time. But the cap was set at a sufficient height that you got, you can recruit a couple of couple of Patrick Cripps, yeah. so you can get in, um, <laughs> you can get in the, the Scarborough gas project over in the west and Narrabri and New South Wales that goes ahead will fit in under that cap. But I'm, I'm still confused on will they have to be any new gas projects have to be net zero? Yeah, well, well, again, yeah, I think so. But 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 the point being is depends it, on the minister ultimately. Yeah, yeah. well, but, he but, gets to decide, mm, isn't he? Yeah, he can change the rules if he has to. So, but the point being is, is as the industry says and as the you know, the, the Japanese ambassador, the head of IMPEX and even the Chinese, it's starting to look like a death by a thousand cuts <laughs> now for, uh, for the gas sector and, and, and the fear being that, you know... Because there's a particularly point... If you want to bring on new... Who's going to stick a few billion into, a, into an as yet sort of untapped development beyond those two I mentioned? If yeah, you've got on top of that, you've got price caps, you've got a, um, a code of conduct coming in which allows the government to, to dictate a fair and reasonable price which effectively acts as a permanent price cap now on gas sales. Mm. So these things all combine to sort of scare off investment, if you like. So that's that's the sort of broader concern. Yeah, and then, I'm sorry if yeah. I just quickly just, you know, my criticism of the Liberals in this case, you know, they, they could have engaged on this during the week. They could have engaged on this. They, they you know, Labor would have much rather done a deal with them than, than the Greens. You know, they could have taken some of the rough edges off this for the gas industry, allow the transition to happen and... And it wouldn't would have sent a, a, a message to you know, like the voters that who just abandoned them on the weekend that they are engaging and in it, climate change. It is they chose not to. It is interesting that Peter Dutton this morning is not saying he will necessarily repeal this new safeguards scheme. Mm. He's, he was very quick to say we're, we're going to repeal the superannuation tax increase, but uh, well, he was essentially saying that um, this is something terrible for the country, and it comes to the. At what point in the cycle of being a new opposition leader do you declare a policy? He's saying this is something that's terrible for the country, that is sending industry overseas, which is not what the, as you were pointing out, it's not what business is saying. But if it's that bad, surely you would come out and say something. Just on the, the Japanese company that caused a lot of ruckus in Inpex, Canberra. Yeah. Inpex. Nothing drives talkback callers and texters more nuts than a conversation about gas. The basic fact that we are pulling tonnes of gas out of the ground and we don't get to use most of it. Whatever is said in Canberra, the fact remains, if you're watching this show now and you paid income tax in the financial year 2021, you as a single individual paid more in tax than that Japanese company did in <laughs> company tax. Because you know how much sure. they paid in that financial year? Zero. Sure. They paid nothing. There are people within kilometres of this studio who are going to have to choose between heating and eating. They will literally choose between yeah, but that, 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 does, that, does, that doesn't distract from the fact that that gas is locked away in export contracts, which of is Of course, which and, is so, and very the federal poor. government's yeah. jimmying its way into yeah. saying, pull some of that back. And there's, and there's more that, of that, that, more that, that can only be... That makes it worse. You, exactly. know, you have to keep um, you know, tra yeah, on, producing this stuff, not for us, but This is the absurdity. Is also, it? the government, as someone said to me, Someone significant in the government said to me this morning, they do not give a flying you-know-what about what this particular company sure, thinks about I, their Sure, I, I, I agree. But if they, if they want to try and land on something that is significant, and I guess to get back to the question of whether or not it's strengthened, the Greens have lost rhetorically because their demand of no new coal or gas, they didn't get that. On the other hand, would that have been in the legislation if that negotiation hadn't happened? So the way I hear it is someone like Tony Plibersek, if she's Environment Minister, you apply for the new project, you have to say what the emissions will be. She doesn't make a decision on that, but you lodge the paperwork with her. They share a department, she and Chris Bowen. Chris Bowen then has public servants look at that and decide whether or not that breaches 
the You're talking about budget. a trigger in the EPBC Act. Yeah. They, they, yes. ha they haven't agreed to legislate. No, they haven't agreed to legislate it, but at the moment, what's been worked into the legislation is that you've at least got to notify what your emissions are. On, on, yeah. mm. it's and then a the public servant's going to have a look at yeah. the budget. Yeah. So what my point is, there are things in there mm. That would not have been there had the Greens kept That's right. not That's right. with us. And these are the things that are... Yeah, so the Greens have made that sort of gain inside the legislation. Politically. It's probably good for our emissions cuts. Nikki, um, the Greens are being more pragmatic, it seems, in this parliament. Deals are being done between Labor and the Greens on a number of fronts. Obviously, Aston shows us last night that's not really hurting Labor to be working with the Greens this time around. But not on the housing affordability fund. They're still uh, yet to lock in any sort of deal on that. W why do you think that is? I mean... The Prime Minister's view of this is, this is bizarre, we're putting more money on the table for social housing, why won't they back it? What's going on there? Well, obviously they're trying to screw the government to um, make sure that there is more money going in. And I don't think anybody questions that more money is needed. Mm. But really, are they, at the end, uh, going to vote against it and ensure that there is no money spent or will they have to agree to yeah. the Phil, you, you, fund that... You've suggested this is because uh, Adam Bant needs to, you know, send the base of his Greens party <laughs> that, that a message would... that he's willing to actually vote no on something. Yeah, that was the view in the government uh, this week that the Greens held out on the half, as it's called, the Housing Affordability Future Fund, yeah. yep. um, because they'd already given a fair bit on, as Raf said, they gave up on the no coal and gas thing, so it's just sort of an, another sort of, um, not surrender, but, you know... Um, Biased negotiation against them would have, uh, mm. you know, would have been a bit too much for the base. So just buy a bit of time. But it, but they've sort of they've drawn a pretty hard line on this. Um, they they weren't they weren't showing any sign of backtracking. Uh, it'll come up again in the budget sessions in May. Uh, I'm, I'm with Nick here. You're really going to vote against this? And Albanese told them, he told them in private negotiations as well as publicly. I'll take this to the election. I'm not yeah, I'm not moving on this. And, uh, on this. Yeah. and it's worth exploring what's going on in the Greens too, Raf, because that deal on the safeguards mechanism, the climate bill, not all of them. Were were necessarily happy to, to sign up to that. Um, there was a bit of debate in the party room, certainly a lot of pressure from Bob Brown as well. I think Adam Bant finds that quite difficult to uh, balance all of those things. I think he's probably frustrated that someone like uh, Bob Brown gets that sort of media attention. Uh, in your guts, you sort of feel that Phil's probably right, you know, that he's, Adam's Bant is basically saying, oh, I can't give in to everything all at once. Yeah. I will say one thing about that. I, no one in this country really understands how that fund works. However, it goes directly to a place the Liberal Party and the National Party can find some traction. I mean, if there is one issue that motivates voters, it's they, everyone knows there's two classes of people in this country, people who can afford property and people who can't. So if there's a way, again, that the Liberal Party can deal themselves into that conversation, that's important. Okay. And I think it's one of the reasons the Greens and the Labor are fighting over it. They know how that resonates. Everyone knows. Everyone knows how hard it is to rent yep. and how hard it is to buy. Yeah, the rise and rise of uh, renters. In, yeah, you know, in, in, that was a factor in, in asset. This is yeah, just borrowing $10 in billion dollars and you use the, in, the interest yes. earnings to build houses. And the Libs say, well, it, you'd be paying more, almost as much interest on the debt yes. as you would, as you would yeah. be earning. So, you know, it's, well, it's, I, uh, and I asked the Prime Minister on Friday, hold on, if you don't earn any money in a year that means you're not actually spending any money yeah. on social but housing. It, and he was like, no, nah, that's not true, because sort of, I think the answer is there's, there's a continuous stream of money coming said, out. I, I was listening fund. to that interview you did, and he did seem to give an assurance that even if, like, the future that, fund has... So that's how I heard it. Backwards, if that they still put yeah, money into If housing. that pocket of cash doesn't earn interest in that year, the future fund's got other money mm. to cover whatever social housing it is that they so, might want to do. That's how I heard the answer. The other big bit of legislation that hasn't, of course, passed Parliament yet but was introduced uh, was the legislation setting up the referendum uh, for the Indigenous voice later in the year. That now goes off to a joint parliamentary committee for the next five or six weeks. Uh, there'll be hearings and uh, you know, examination of the wording that's been put forward. Um, Nikki, last night's vote in Aston, look, this by-election may not have been much about the voice, but does it show that the coalition is speaking to a diminishing section of the electorate? And what does that mean for this debate about how important bipartisanship will be on this, uh, on this referendum? Well, I think from uh, Labor's perspective, um, at least, last night's uh, result, um, they see that as strengthening their case for The Voice. Um, Albanese is still obviously uh, very popular. Um, he's uh, gained in authority. Uh, people like the way he's going about uh, the job. I do think that uh, people generally think there are still legitimate questions that need to be answered uh, by the government um, on this. 
Well, and just on that, let's let's take a look at some of the questions because the coalition really did put it up a gear during the week in asking all sorts of uh, questions about what issues the voice is going to weigh in on. Will the Reserve Bank need to consult with the voice before making a decision on interest rates? Prime Minister, will the voice need to be consulted on defence and foreign affairs matters? Prime Minister, will the voice be justiciable? The Prime Minister of our country should be able to answer the most basic questions right. about the government's policy it's intent. Idiot. Nikki, are these fair questions or is this a bit some alarmist? Of them, or? Some of them are fair. Uh, some of them, I think, are designed to, um, I think, undermine uh, confidence in it and uh, they're also a stalling tactic uh, for Dutton. And um, I think the longer that kind of thing goes on, the more it will... OK, it might diminish support for The Voice, but it will also diminish the Liberal Party. I mean, this is another one of the great debates of our day and the Liberal Party is making itself irrelevant to it. The Prime Minister was clearly getting frustrated with some of these questions, as, as we saw in this response. The Voice is not about defence policy. It's not about foreign affairs policy. It's not about uh, these issues. Uh, the voice is about issues that directly affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Technically, Phil, though, as yeah. Megan Davis has <clears> pointed out, it can or it would be yeah. able to provide advice across the board on these things. It's, it's more a question of would it really be that yeah, I mean, concerned I about all this stuff? Pro probably not. I mean, you know, we're always really good in this country when we come to things like this of coming out with what could go wrong or yeah. what could happen rather than, you know, what, what could actually achieve. And especially with Aboriginal things, you know, there's always going to be, there's going to be lawyers at 100 paces if we do Mabo or Wick or the apology and, and again. But I, 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 at the same time, I think the PM's got to be a little bit careful about reacting in an indignant fashion to every question about the voice. We were at a yeah, press conference during the week and um, I think it was Sarah Ison from The Australian asked quite a, a question about, about gas. It was, it was the Safeguards press yeah. conference, and would this be the sort of thing now? Indigenous Which people, is a fair question. Yeah, often yeah. coal and gas projects. Can yeah, and we've just been to a Greens, um, uh, a Greens press conference where oh God, I've got a name, but the Aboriginal senator for the Greens, Dorinda Cox, had, Dorinda, yeah, had raised this very point. And Sarah from the Oz asked this question. The PM sort of got a bit got a bit antsy with her. And I think you've just got to be careful with that. So there are there are people are asking questions legitimately, not in every case. I think. With what's happening in Parliament, I think the Libs are giving themselves, they're, they're preparing to be able to vote no or, or to oppose it. Seems it's, pretty good. The only thing There's no doubt. The only it, choice is whether it's a soft no or a hard no. Well, I, yeah, or, I'm, I'm or told. Or whether the, the he's going to be... um, allow his MPs to vote yes. Yeah. No, yeah. well, I'm, I'm, I'm no. hearing yeah. the prospect of a conscience vote are yeah. disappearing yeah. as well. They're Did, heading just... towards a no position. I just want to show you, too, the Attorney General, Mark Dreyfus, he introduced the legislation, delivered what's called the second reading speech. Now, that speech is always important. Courts can look at that second reading speech if they're trying to better understand the intention of legislation. And he went to the issues, the parameters that The Voice uh, will be able to advise on. Matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples would include matters specific to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and matters relevant to the Australian community, including general laws or measures but which affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples differently to other members of the Australian community. And Raf, that language is interesting. Matters that affect Aborig Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders differently. That speech is really important. If something goes to the High Court, uh, when you question something in the Constitution, you yeah. look at the intent behind the person that wrote the law. So if it's in the original constitution, you go back to the people who wrote the original one. If the High Court examines this power, they will look at that speech, they will look at the explanatory memorandum in the legislation. The other thing is the, the actual words may make representations. Doesn't say consult, because that's got baggage in international law. Doesn't say advise, because ministers advise the Governor General. That is really limited legal language. Um, I would say this, I tried this on a constitutional lawyer and they said, well, I wouldn't say it quite this way, but the voice can talk, the government does not have to listen. Mm. And the government only needs to listen in as much as it said it would in that speech and in that explanatory memorandum. But there's something that I, comes up all of the time if I go and speak to people, um, you know, in different electorates or if people ring up most of the country, and I, I mean this in the kindest possible way, don't know what the voice no. is. No. They don't know what it's for. They don't know what it will do. 
So those questions are incredibly powerful. Whether or not they're fair or not, yeah. they will make a huge difference. And there's a big gap between this modest, generous proposal and then this fundamental shift in the way things will change right. for First yeah. Nations people. And, and that gap is where the no case so can, can drive, drive right through. through. It's, it's always, just, yeah, sorry, go I was just going to say very quickly before we, um, before we move on, um, the wages issue this week, Phil, I just wanted some thoughts on this. Remember during the election campaign, Anthony Albanese said he absolutely supported mm. uh, an inflation level wage yep. rise for the low paid. He got absolutely smashed yep. up. Scott Morrison called him a loose unit. Yep. Um, look, he's basically said the same in their submission to this, yeah. this year's. We, we back an inflation level wage rise for yeah. the minimum wage at least. Um, but it seems a, a different reaction. It, it is because of the politics has changed, obviously. As we, you know, Albanese is much more in tune with the zeitgeist about fairness and so forth. Also in the election campaign, it took Mr Albanese a couple of days to actually explain he was only it talking was messy. minimum wage yeah. earners. This time they were, very, they were explicit up front. We're only talking about when they're saying inflation linked to rise, the 184,000 people on minimum wage. It was the ACTU came out and said, what about all the award workers as well, which yeah, the government doesn't agree with. And Tony Burke was quite specific of that. That's, that's a recipe for danger. So... Um, yeah, it's, it's a bit it, more limited it, this time. Everyone's, everyone's far more nuanced this time than right. last year. Our panel, Nikki Sava, Raf Epstein and Phil Curry, will be back shortly with some final observations. Time now for Mike Bowers and Talking Pictures. I'm Mike Bowers and I'm photographer large for The Guardian Australia. I'm talking pictures with photographer for the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, the one and only Alex Ellinghouse. A very warm welcome back. Good morning, Mike. Thanks for having me. Mate, massive week. Yep. Um, massive two weeks, really, mm -hmm. of Parliament, but a lot of uh, legislation was, important legislation was passed. And I think yep. Jackie Lambie and David Pocock spoke for everyone when there was a piece of legislation that passed on the voices. They looked very yep. happy yeah, yeah, that yes. they didn't have to spend more time in the Senate because there were some mm. all-night sittings. Yeah, yeah, they, uh, they sat till well, just past after four the other day. 4am, yeah. Yeah, and this is um, the last we'll see of them until the May budget. Alex, the voice was one step closer to mm -hmm. being heard mm -hmm. as the government introduced the referendum legislation into Parliament. It's the first formal step towards holding the referendum on the voice. Yep. Uh, and we saw the Attorney General, Mark Dreyfus, uh, enter the chamber. He was embraced by Senator Malandiri McCarthy. Yeah, well, they he... came from the other place, yeah. didn't they, the Senators? There was um, Nita Green, Malandiri McCarthy mm -hmm. and, and Jana Stewart. The, 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 there was notice, noticeably on the front bench. They're not mm -hmm. normally there. They pulled the Indigenous members of the House of Reps yep. forward to sit behind Mark Dreyfus, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. We had uh, Linda Burney, uh, Marion Scrimjaw and uh, Gordon Reid sitting yeah, behind sitting behind them. Quite noticeably, yeah. and I think quite pointedly, mm. um, um, Peter Dutton said he had a previous uh, appointment. Front bench remained pretty empty, I've got to say. It did fill up a little bit more yep. than this. This was right at the start, but you can't say that was an accident. This has got to be the image that they wanted to portray of it. It's, it's a very stark contrast. For that time in the morning, even the public galleries had quite a few people yep. in the chamber it that was... were there to, to witness this. I thought John Cadelka summed it up beautifully, uh, Dutton Nullius. Yeah, yeah mm. it's such, a, it's such, a, such a stark image, isn't this? Yeah, because it's such a key piece of legislation, mm. it was a, almost a celebratory feel, and Linda Burney stepped forward here. Linda Burney, she was acknowledging the, the people in uh, the public galleries there was a standing ovation. This is probably the key mm. photo for me. This was mm. yours. Mm. What are you looking for when, when you know there's going to be uh, a form of celebration or a form of acknowledgement like that? What, what is it you're looking for to capture? I tend to position myself to, in, in, in the gallery where I kind of think that they will look towards. And that gallery that I was sitting at had a lot of um, people um, that were facing the, the, the government and that was where she looked towards to acknowledge after the uh, Attorney General introduced the bill in the Parliament. The other piece of big legislation that came through was the safeguard mechanisms mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. um, they might not be carbon copies of each other but Greens and Labor finally did come to a sort of a uh, a rough agreement. Yeah, yeah, there was, there was, a, there, there was a deal. An we... understanding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, ob obviously the uh, government needed the green support for this. Yeah, to... Adam Bant looks really very happy there. <laughs> <laughs> but Chris Bowen certainly did. He seemed to be pretty animated the whole week, but um, mm -hmm. particularly when he was taking carriage of this safeguard mechanisms um, and it went to the Senate and then came back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Peter Dutton and his team were there. They opposed it. 
He's very much trying to resurrect the ghost of carbon tax past because yep. I heard him use the word carbon tax quite a mm -hmm. number of times. Yeah, and we see that in this uh, this, this terrific cartoon over yeah, here. Yeah, David Rowe, the light at the beginning of the tunnel. Yeah, and you see the ghost of, uh, that must be Bob Brown over yeah. there. And uh, is that Tony Abbott? That's Tony Abbott, I think, and in the corner here is uh, is Peter Dutton. If the hard cap fits, as he's putting the mining cap on, Adam yeah. Bant, the leader of the Greens. Beautiful Glenn Lelievre. Yep. You're welcome to stay, but I can't seem to get rid of these squatters. And it's um, gas and coal on the... Uh, on the couch watching the telly. Yeah, while well, the, t the turbine and the, uh, the solar panel are trying to get in. <laughs> Alex, finally, our former host, Barry Cassidy, has become an insider of a different sort. He's been appointed chair of the Museum of Australian Democracy at Old Parliament House. Yeah, this is the uh, second take, isn't it? I mean, yeah. he was initially appointed in 2013 and then due to all the controversy and... There was uh, a change yeah. of government and they decided that uh, they probably didn't like him as chair mm. and uh, Barry stepped down and mm -hmm. um, he's been now reappointed, which is, uh, it's lovely. So it's... Uh, Back to you at Old Parliament House, Barry. And back to you, David. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Mike. And yes, congratulations, Chairman Barry and all the folks at Old Parliament House, a wonderful institution. Let's get some final observations now, Phil. Um, we've got a budget coming up, David, and uh, reported during the week by my colleague Michael Reid that the NDIS needs another $5.7 billion uh, for the next four years. At the last budget in October, it needed another eight. I think the Co Coalition's last budget, an another 13. The thing is now completely out of control in terms of cost. Uh, there are now real uh, people inside the government who are questioning the sustainability of the scheme, unless it's got back to what it was meant to do in the first place. Um, and, you know, saying the same things as Scott Morrison and Linda Reynolds were saying publicly, that it's becoming unsustainable. It will cost, at this rate, over $2 trillion over the next 30 years, compared to the $368 billion for AUKUS. So, uh, when we talk about tough decisions, that's the toughest one there. Raf. Just another reminder about how hard referendums are to win. Uh, the polls are pretty significantly, I think if you read them broadly on The Voice, the polls are pretty significantly in support of The Voice. The difference between this referendum and the Republic referendum is you've got a Prime Minister arguing the yes case, not the no case, so that is big. But just a reminder, if we can have a look at this graphic of the polls leading up to the last referendum in 99, you can be significantly ahead uh, and you can still lose because of, and I would argue with the Republic case, it was the same. It was the gap between, here's this small, modest change, but somehow it's going to fundamentally change the nature of the country. That was the argument behind the Re Republic referendum, and it didn't work. So that's the... There is still a significant mountain for the government and for the yes case to climb. Nikki. Over the last uh, few weeks, the uh, Liberal Party has been trying to construct a narrative of bullying by uh, Labor MPs against Liberal women. And um, often some of the claims that have been made have been misleading or exaggerated. In any case, all that uh, came to a crashing halt uh, during the week when a group of them, Liberal MPs, men and women, stormed out of the chamber against the order of the Speaker and injured a female attendant in the process. Not ideal. Uh, thank you all very much for joining us on a very busy Sunday morning. Finally, the Parliamentary Speaker, speaking of which, never has an easy job keeping the House under control. But there were a few smiles when Milton Dick tried to lay down the law this week. We'll leave you with that. Thanks for watching. Call to the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport. No, no, the Minister will resume his seat. The Member for Barker will leave the chamber. I have been crystal clear about that sort of behaviour. No, when members are asking questions, they'll be heard in silence. The time to interject is when the Minister is speaking, not when. <laughs> Correct that record. Let's get on with it. You're making us all feel very excited about being here.